I'm going to start, I was very moved by Anthony's um, protest poem. Um, this uh, is a poem about um, mosquitoes, but also malaria, and I think I think of this as one of my protest poems. I don't know, I don't, almost don't know if I have the right to speak in this way, but um, for me, like, the Black Lives Matter is global, and um, it was a real education how quickly we came up with cure, a cure or an inoculation for COVID uh, when malaria has been such a massive problem for so long. So, um, you yeah, know, what lives do we value? Um, so this is Mosquitoes, Mozambique. How we collectively itch under their collective wine. All night, insects thicken round the clinic's outdoor light. In the malaria ward, the beds are pushed so close, the sleepers share the same bad dream. A female mosquito filling her soft bulb, dipping her beak for a drop of blood to ripen her eggs. How her abdomen's rosé flush deepens to ruby as she siphons out water as waste. The sleepers part. Over at the NGO dorm, we swap mosquito law-like cards. They become accustomed to, or are indifferent to, or possibly mock citronella. They'll find a way in. Even the smallest tear in a mosquito net is an open door and your body is a welcome mat on which they wipe their feet before inserting a straw. They use two serrated needles to cut through your tissues, two needles to hold the flesh apart, one to insert a chemical spit to keep your blood running and a proboscis to home in to suck. Their eyesight's alleged to be poor. They see you better when you move and are attracted to blondes and restless sleepers. They smell your breath. Some of us smell sweeter. One of their chosen ones, I verge on paranoia. Long sleeves, trousers tucked into socks after dark, a cotton scarf to protect the back of my neck. My lips tingle with deet. If I lick them, my tongue bitters and numbs. I brush at my face obsessively, keep my feet tucked under me and chafe. I'm not the only one. Out on the veranda, the Dutch intern swipes an electric racket through the air. Every time it intercepts an insect, it makes an exaggerated buzz. It pleases him to hear them frizz, to imagine their bodies forked in hot blue light as they electrocute and spasm. Like Deet, his bat is indiscriminate and zaps fruit flies, crane flies, moths, beetles on the wing. Think of insecticide sprayed over cities from plains, falling mist fine over ditches, a soft, particulate rain. The sweltering night suddenly quiet in the city park. The frogs' pale bellies moonside up. Snakes like sloppy inner tubes rotting in the grass. And think of Honesty's daughter hallucinating in bed as Honesty loosens her cornrows with trembling fingers and sings to her in undertones collapsed by her own uneven breath, the nearest clinic hours away on broken roads. The malaria swells and burns till her girl arches from her pallet bed and drums her heels. Her eyes roll back in her head, raised beyond and gone, though her mother tries to call her home daughter, baby girl. It makes me sick to write this, as if I make it happen. But every two minutes, a child. 
Survivors sway in the open bed of the hired trucks, ululating and screaming as they rattle to the burial ground. Meanwhile, Imo Hansen, merciful professor, inserts his naked wrist through the sleeved neck tunnel of a mosquito incubator, a special iridescent species, and suffers them to feed, keep steady despite the itch, because these rainforest jewels might have secrets to tell. And in London, a woman splices a mosquito egg to corrupt the gene that defines male sex. There will be infertile males, and in eight generations, a matter of days, the brood will collapse. Still, my architect friend on the Ilia sleeps in one bed with his Mozambican wife and sons. He jolts awake every few minutes to check that his wife and boy's beloved flesh isn't touching the net or near the net or within arm's length of the net where he imagines a mosquito might intrude its fine needle. Again and again he shuffles them in till they sleep in a riddled heap at the centre of the bed swimming in the vast margins of his terror. I don't have children yet, though I have miscarried, and hold myself like a crystal glass, full to the brim, afraid to spill, afraid to harm a single ovum. When I am feverish, I take myself to the hospital and cue to have my finger pricked in the whitewashed clinic. Hundreds of mothers mill outside the slow pharmacy. Pills are passed at intervals through a metal grill. Babies are weighed on clock-faced scales, suspended from the ceiling, laying in dangling knotted slings, the way in old cartoons newborns are brought in bundles hanging from a stork's beak, the longed-for gift. The man driven insane by dysentery, turmeric yellow shit dribbling down his leg, stirs in the hospital garbage with a stick and won't let anyone come near. My name is called. I've tested negative and can go. I walk, shaking with relief and fever, back to the dorm, through aircon buses and airports and planes, back to my privileged northern isle, in which my babies will be inoculated against most ills, and God willing, inshallah, whatever it takes, I will give, will live. I do not deserve this life. I'm going to read a cheerier one now. Um, so, uh, Auntie and I share a Cypriot interest connection. <laughs> um, when I lived there, I had cockroaches. <laughs> and uh, there was one I used to see a lot, and then I didn't see it anymore. And then I discovered that was because it was flat under my bath mat. <laughs> Um, I'm very frightened of them, like, they run very fast and they'll run at you and um, they're scary. <laughs> but then, uh, for this I had to do, write some poems about bugs and I discovered that they're really good mothers. Um, you know, I think every organism on this planet has a function. Um, so I tried to celebrate cockroaches as good mamas. Mama cockroach, I love you. Because you cosy with the aunties in your reeking slums and are intimate and sweet. Because you begrudge no one a meal, but ooze a fecal trail to lead your commune to its source, like a dirty bee. <laughs> because you are joyfully promiscuous. Because you pouch your young and hide them in the sweaty creases of the house, near superating food, so they'll hatch to a feast. Or keep your eggs with you in a special purse shaped like a kidney bean and clutch it fast. 
or reinsert them into your abdomen and womb them there, or carry them as yolks and give live birth, then feed your pale brood secretions from your anus or your armpit glands like milk, or deep in the flesh of a rotten log, pass them a bolus of pre-digested food mouth to mouth. Because you suffer your young to swarm upon your back and do not flinch or buck them off, but carry them, like a human playing horsey with her children, down on hands and knees, decrying the swag of her own loose flesh. Because you twirl your antennae gracefully to test your crawl space. Because strokingly you caress your offspring's backs and gentle them with pretty pheromones and chirps. Because you purr when your young stroke your face. Because you would leave your body for your offspring to dine upon all the liquors and gravy of the obscene world, your work in the crannies delivered to the living, because you are, despite all rumours, mortal. And what if you are crushed before your eggs can be delivered? What if your sisters drive you hissing out? What if your kitchen is fumigated? What if the mongoose, the lizard, the snake, a muscular tongue prying at the warm and greasy interstices of your stubborn occupancy takes you in its mouth? Someone must care for the dirt. <laughs> Poor cockroaches, hey? Um, I'm going to read one short poem about boarding school. I'm an RAF kid. Um, I went to about six state schools before I was 11 and then I got sent to boarding school. Please don't assume that is equivalent to privilege. It's, <laughs> it's a complex thing. It's privileged and it's not. <laughs> Um, so this is a poem called Matron Medicine. I'm pretending to read, but really I'm watching the matron, plat Lizzie Broadbent's long dark hair ready for bed. The matron's in a good mood. She gives Lizzie a hug and tucks her in then offers Jess a cuddle too, and immediately everyone in the dorm is up on their feet and queuing. The way when we're sick, we queue outside the medicine cupboard for linctus or paracetamol, as if love were cowpole and the matron were the spoon. We open our mouths like desperate little chicks and flap our wings and cheep, but remember not to shove. Only I don't get up. I cannot move for shyness and somehow mistrust the offer. What if she sends me back? She looks over the top of Sophie's head and says with an edge that I'm not the cuddling sort. Dumbly I nod and hump down under the covers and wait for the lights to go out, for everything to stop. So there's a section in this book um, that retells the story of Pasifaye, who was the mother of the Minotaur, and is mostly remembered through the lens of sexual deviance, like happens to quite a few historical powerful women. Um, so she's remembered for having slept with a bull, although when you look at the myths that could be a kind of symbolic ritual rather than a actual sleeping with a bull, <laughs> you think? <laughs> Um, so, I kind of retold her story. She's at, she's at the centre of a lot of amazing myths and stories and kind of tried to restore her to her power. Having said that, I'm now going to read a poem about her sleeping with a bull. <laughs> Pacify on wanting. 
I moved in desire, its shining atmosphere, dilated, ripe, under its enchantment, hid in shallow corners to knead myself hard, entered myself with anything that came to hand, screamed your name, the dark night in between aching on my skin, the letters I sent, the desperate poems, the tenor always you, 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 felt myself despised and couldn't stop. Flashes of you behind my eyelids, my own electric skin, always wet, always on the verge of coming. I begged you to take me, even if you had to do it blindfold, even if I had to climb into the scraped out carcass of a cow, its hollow abattoir, press myself up like an abject Russian doll and let you enter me in any sore hole if that would please you, if I could feel you. Desire makes beasts to be ridden of us all. And I'm going to finish um, with a poem that's told from Ariadne's perspective. So um, Ariadne was the daughter of Pasiphae and in the stories, she's the one that gives Theseus the ball of wool. So then when he goes into the labyrinth to kill the Minotaur, he, he uses the ball of wool to find his way back out again. Um, and my story kind of reimagines the Minotaur um, as not a monster, but a disabled child, because um, I've read that in ancient civilizations, disabled children were often exposed um, and left out to die, and I imagined that um, Pacify, as a sister of a great healer, she's sister of Circe, that she instead brought up this disabled child in complete defiance of the conventions of the day. Um, yeah. So this is Ariadne's version of what happened to her brother, and his name is Asterios. So when she talks about Asterios, that's her the Minotaur figure. Ariadne on Asterios' imprisonment in the labyrinth. Most people couldn't understand him. You had to listen. He had a way of speaking. Some words, some signs. Give, please, help. And usually about our mother, mine. Ma was mother, obviously. He called me me. He'd tilt his head if he wanted to be petted, could sway it for a no, a nod for yes. Sometimes he was rough, but I could manage him. The trick was to kick him behind the knees and he'd fold like a pile of blocks. We had a sign for sorry. You patted your chest. Sometimes I find myself patting there still, that blighted sorry place, as I apologize to him lost in that faraway forgetting zone. After his imprisonment, I lead him out at night. Daedalus showed me the way, the concealed door, the lock, the thread. At first, my brother would run like mad ahead of me along the path, head down, making his noise for happy, tacking back and forth. Often we went to the beach and swam in the dark, the water firing all round us with tiny phosphorescent sparks. He'd spout the water out of his mouth like a joyous black-furred dolphin. When he was tired, he'd lie on the damp sand and watch the extravagant sky, a little noise for each slipped star, the Milky Way reflected in his eyes. For months it was enough, but we are grandchildren of the sun. It sickens us not to feel its blaze. After a while I could barely coax him out at night. And when we sat, all he would do was rest his head against his knees and slump and rock. Then he became so thin he could barely walk. I'd lead him tottering out, and he'd sink to the ground, too weak to make the beach. He stank of piss. 
I was afraid, but couldn't think of how to get him free. I made excuses to visit less and was ashamed. One night, he turned his face to me and tilted so I'd stroke his cheek and sign the words slowly, clearly. I heard them plain as if he'd placed them singly in my brain. Want, die. And then he made the sign for help. Brother, look at me now. I'm signing sorry. It took me months to say yes. It took me years to find a way. And by the time he came, with his swagger and deceit, looking under his eyelashes at our sister Fedra, you lost all speech. You were eating your own feces. You didn't know me. You didn't know yourself.